Well, my computer clock says it's 12.02. So I would like to uh, welcome everyone to this, the um, third presentation in our Spring 2021 Sustainability Research and Practice Seminar. My name is Bradley Flam. I'm the director of Westchester University's Office of Sustainability. And um, I'm honored to um, be able to tell you that we are co-sponsoring uh, this series of fascinating talks with the Office for Research and Sponsored Programs and the Office of Distance Learning and Innovation, as well as uh, Westchester University's Sustainability Councils Scholarly and Creative Activities Committee. Um, so we are uh, thrilled to be able to welcome uh, Professor Joan Welch and Mr. Michael Dunn uh, for today's presentation. And so without further ado, I will pass the digital floor to the two of you. Great, thank you, Brad. And uh, you know, I've really appreciated all of these talks and these opportunities to share what we're uh, all, uh, all doing. And so uh, today we're gonna be talking about the Westchester Burroughs Urban Forest. And years ago, I went to an American Association of Geographers meeting and I went to this session and it was called the Urban Forest, an oxymoron. And it was by uh, Dr. Rowan Roundtree who is a geographer out of Berkeley, who ended up working at the Forest Service in their urban ecology, uh, urban forestry division. And I uh, sort of went on to do my PhD research with support from the Forest Service to study the Boston's, Boston's urban forests in uh, their minority dominated neighborhoods. Because I recognized at that point in time that people would living in cities would use less infrastructure and would have less of an impact on the environment. And so we really needed to make cities as pleasant and beautiful place as possible so that people would stay living in relatively compact environments. And so um, that's how I got introduced to the urban forest. And uh, it isn't an oxymoron, right? Uh, trees in our urban environment, our community, a forest. And when we look at the urban forest, we're talking about both the public and the private trees that make up what we call the canopy or the, the leafy part of the forest in an urban area. And the reason why we're interested in studying the urban forest is because it really provides incredible benefits to city residents and those Folks who've been working in, in the urban forest area at the US Forest Service and Jerry Hertels here, he's a, a retired forest service entomologist. We're arguing that the trees are essential infrastructure, right? They're, they're as important as sidewalks and, and storm sewers and uh, electrical wires, right? So in the city, we should think of our trees as very important infrastructure. So what does the urban forest do for us? What are the ecosystem services? And I listened to Robin Wall Kimmerer a couple of weeks ago. Dr. Kimmerer is uh, uh, from the Maple Nation of the Potawatomi tribe and also uh, an ecologist. She said, we should think of these things as gifts, right? The gifts that the urban forest gives to us. It helps us save energy. It manages stormwater for us. It takes up air pollutants. It removes carbon from the atmosphere and, and produces oxygen for us, right? And then there are aesthetics and other public values associated with the urban forest. And I'm going to detail each of these a little bit more in just a minute. And then the big one, uh, well, for some of us, the big one is habitat. So what's the big picture here? We're in a global insect population crisis. 80% of the insect populations have been lost on the planet. And it's happened slowly enough that many people don't realize that it has gone on. Because the insects are gone, 
all birds feed their babies, insect larvae, caterpillars, etc., we're starting to see that translating into a loss of one in four birds in North America, gone over the last 50 years. And so we're in the middle of the sixth greatest extinction event on the planet. There have been five previous ones. This one, it's pretty clear that it's human behavior that is causing it. And of course, we're also all very concerned about the climate crisis. And so, as I mentioned to you, trees factor into moderating or regulating our atmosphere and climate. And finally, we have issues related to access to environmental goods and the distribution of the environmental not so nice, not so good, and the distribution of the environmental goods is not equitable in our country. And so we also want the urban forest and environmental good to be distributed equitably across our cities. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, actually right now. So my concern when I was doing my doctoral dissertation in Boston was that uh, some neighborhoods were going to have a better public urban forest than others, street and park trees. And the neighborhood I was working in was North Dorchester and Roxbury. And uh, this is where Martin Luther King Boulevard is in Boston. And this area had been redlined in uh, the middle 1900s. And redlining is when the banks take a, uh, a map and they circle areas in red and they say, do not loan to these neighborhoods, right? And that creates a sort of a series of housing stock decline and uh, neighborhood decline. So a recent study, and it's uh, cited down here, shows that 94% of 108 US urban areas, elevated surface temperatures are in formerly redlined areas relative to non-redlined neighbors. And there can be a temperature difference as great as seven degrees Celsius. That's a lot, right? <clears throat> so nationally, land surface temperatures in redlined areas, okay, on a cold day like today, you're thinking, well, that would be nice, but in the heat of the summer, this urban heat island is uh, not a good thing. So, but nationally, land surface temperatures in redlined areas are approximately 2.6 degrees Celsius warmer than in non-redlined areas. And so this is an environmental injustice phenomena. It results in higher heat related stress and deaths and is also uh, environmental racism. So we want to think of our urban forests as a infrastructure that can address this, right? So now I'm gonna talk just a little bit uh, more about the details of the benefits of the urban forest. So urban forests help us conserve energy because it breaks up wind speeds in the winter time and it reduces the heat loss from the buildings in the winter time. And in the summer, it shades buildings and it reduces the electric, electricity use for air conditioning. Storm water, trees hold an incredible amount of rain and snow and so you can reduce the amount of runoff in urban environments by increasing your canopy cover. And that means you're not treating that water at the wastewater treatment facility, right? Which has a cost. And uh, you're not experiencing some of the damage that happens to flooding. Air quality, uh, and I'm, I'm giving you these descriptions because they actually come from the software that the US Forest Service developed called iTrees. And we're gonna look at the data for the borough of Westchester in just a second here on these different parameters, these different variables. But air quality, uh, it quantifies uh, the air pollutants. We're looking at oxygen, nitrogen oxide, sulfur dioxide, and particulate matter that's deposited on tree surfaces. And that 
is taken out of the air pollutant, uh, out of our atmosphere, out of the air, air. And it also is quantifying the reduced emissions from power plants because of the reduced electricity use. So when we look at the value of trees with air quality, those are the calculations that go into it. And so this is from the iTree Streets User's Manual. And there's the citation there. So we um, got to go out and measure all the street trees in the Boston, in Westchester Borough, thanks to the grant that we got from the Office of Sustainability in the summer of 2018. And so there's uh, Eric Chapman. I don't know if we have any geography folks here. And here's Kimmy Kutzler and Connie Dreger. This is a wonderful stormwater green infrastructure and it's got trees in it. I think these actually um, are fruit bearing trees. They might be doom berries. And so uh, in combination with not only trees but also green infrastructure, you can really manage your stormwater really, really well. This is a beautiful oak tree in uh, Center City, Westchester. And you can see that it's got a wire going through it and it's not impacting either the wire or the tree too terribly much, but this is something we don't like to see. Another description of benefits, carbon dioxide, the annual reduction in atmospheric carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas due to take up by the trees, sequestration by the trees, and also reduced emissions from power plants due to reduced energy. So they're measuring the carbon dioxide reductions in a couple of ways. And uh, then this last piece here is carbon stored, right? So we're taking it out of the atmosphere and then we're actually storing it too. And uh, finally, I couldn't live in a world without trees. I imagine you're the, probably the same way, but uh, trees represent uh, very important aesthetic benefits. Uh, you, you know, research shows that you look at trees and it releases the stress and, and allows your mind to uh, refocus. You know, I was always one of those students who had to sit by the window so I could look outside and I'm still like that. And I encourage my students to do that. So the only way that the aesthetic or other benefits are calculated in the iTree software is by the amount that they estimate that trees will increase your property values. And of course they say, this is a rough estimate that having a tree in your front yard can increase your home value anywhere from you know, 5,000 to $10,000. But that's the only way they're measuring that. And here's the eye trees uh, thing again. So where is the data that we're gonna report on? Where was it collected? It was collected in Westchester, Pennsylvania, where I am now, and I think many of you are here now. And <clears throat> here's the borough, <coughs> excuse me, our population uh, and uh, area and our population density. And I checked out Philly's population density is 11,000 and New York's is 27,000. So we're a relatively urbanized um, location as far as population density is concerned concerned. So I got this wonderful grant from the uh, Office of Sustainability and uh, in the spring of 2018 and I found three great students to hire and we went out and collected uh, street tree data. I'll just show you this is um, data that Michael Don shared with me uh, that the Westchester Borough tree budget in 2018 was about 167,000, and that includes street and park trees. All right, oops, okay, there we go. So the students had a great time working with the Borough Tree Commission and Michael Dunn to develop a geodatabase. What sort of information do we wanna have about our street trees? And these are the variables that we worked on uh, to collect. And here's sort of a screenshot of uh, the uh, online data collection system. They were smartphones, right? We could just pull up uh, the data collection on the smartphone. So here's the trees. There's Kimmy and Connie again. Look at this gorgeous sycamore tree and that blue sky. Wow. 
So in town, we have about 2,800 total trees. I'm sure it's more than that because Michael's been busy. We have about 111 different tree species. And one of the variables that we decided to collect were empty tree wells. So we could figure out right away where we could put in more trees. And there were a lot of them. And then we wanted to know about the trees because for me, as a uh, someone who studies the urban forest, it breaks my heart when we have this big, beautiful tree that dies and we put in a little tree that's not going to get very big in its place. And that's a lot less tree work going on. So I have a bias towards putting in larger trees, trees that are going to be large at maturity versus trees that are going to be small at maturity. So wonderful surprise in the borough. Uh, over 1,700 of our trees are going to be large at maturity if they're not there already. And then we have medium at maturity at 21% and small at maturity at 17%. Your urban forest is only going to provide as much as many gifts as it is able to if it's uh, healthy, right? Or if the trees are doing well. And so one of the a couple of the questions we looked at were, are the trees in the right place? And so from the database, we found that there were a large number of trees that were going to be big at maturity that were in conflict with with the wires. And that's, you know, that's not a good thing. And then we had 204 small trees that were planted in places where there could have been a bigger tree planted, where there were no overhead wires. So that doesn't. Uh, make us happy either. So here are the data points for uh, the tree locations. We finished data collection in the fall of December, uh, fall of 2018. And um, you can see there's some places where there are fewer street trees and uh, might need a little help in those neighborhoods and Michael's been working on them. So when we did the iTree analysis of benefits or gifts provided by the borough forest using uh, the Forest Service iTree software, this is what we found. In energy, this is our annual on an annual basis, right? Here's the values for the total forest. And this is the value per tree on average. So on average, every tree in the borough is providing us with about $120 worth of benefits. And it's a $342,000 worth of benefits uh, when you consider them all together. And this uh, shows you a graphic. If, if we had different zones in the city, like if we had different neighborhoods, we could have broken it out by different neighborhoods, but we, uh, we didn't do that. And so, um, Here's the stored carbon dioxide benefits and the replacement value of street trees. So you can see that we have an uh, incredible amount of carbon sitting in our trees. And that's carbon that's not in the atmosphere then, right? That's stored carbon. And this replacement value of public trees by zone is giving us a little bit of a sense of how much our infrastructure and in trees is worth, right? You say, well, this building is worth this much money or, you know, it, it, we've got this much pipe laid for the sewer and how much is that worth? So you can see we have a pretty significant, I mean, uh, over $13 million worth of tree infrastructure here in the borough that if we had to replace it, that's what it would cost. So we look at the total benefits provided by the street trees, and this is just the street trees as compared to the tree budget. And what we see in 2018 is that we were getting about $2 of benefits or gifts from every tree or for every dollar invested, sorry, $2 of benefits for every dollar invested. And that's a sort of a, it's a rough estimate. And the budget here includes park trees 
as well as street trees. So, and we didn't, we don't have park trees in our database. So this is a, a simplistic calculation, right? That, and it, and it doesn't also, it doesn't take into that amount of stored carbon that we have out there in our street tree population. The aesthetics benefit is a gross underestimation and it does not include the health related benefits of having trees and uh, in your area and also some of the importance of the habitat outcomes for having trees. So we'll just say simplistically that the aesthetics are not in there. And I think this is probably my last slide before Michael gets to take it over. Maybe, <laughs> can't see the slide number anymore. Um, but in the borough in 2018, this is the number of trees that we had in their size class at maturity under wires. And what we want here are small and medium trees. And for the locations where there were no overhead electric wires or other wires, it's wonderful to see that we have mostly large trees, right? So in places where there is no uh, issue with the airspace, we have planted large trees and that's great. I really want all large trees under those places with no wires. And so I'm not, it would be, I'd rather that there be much fewer small and medium trees in places where there's no overhead conflict with wires. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And unless Michael Don winks at me, where's Michael? Oh, there he is. I'm, right. um, I'm good to switch to presenter mode. So whoever's okay. in charge, if they could do that, that'd be great. I think Amy said you have, can you share your screen? Um, okay, yep, I can. Okay. Everybody good? I think this is the correct slide. So um, hey everybody, my name is Mike Dunn. I'm the borough arborist for Westchester. And uh, Joan, um, Dr. Welch looked at kind of the bigger picture. We're gonna go into a, more of a, a detail of some of the stuff I'm working on. So tree wells in Westchester are always an issue. Soil volume for urban trees is a major concern. So well size and associated growing space preferably would be as big as the canopy, which as you know, is hard to achieve in the urban setting. So trees uh, rely on a very complex network of communication through their fungal networks. The mycorrhizae fungal networks allow trees to trade nutrients. They increase their capacity to gather nutrients from the soil, but they also communicate amongst themselves throughout these networks. So there's some really interesting research out there that we're just now learning the basics of this. And there's a whole universe that we don't even know about. So they share resources, but in the urban environment, they're isolated and they cannot do so. So we want to uh, improve that. And soil is critical for the survival of, of all trees. And most of our urban soils are completely sterilized. And if they're not sterilized by the site conditions, then they get sterilized by human interaction, dumping chemicals into their uh, soil zones. So the better approach is to mimic the natural forest process. So a combination of compost and biochar has been really effective at mimic, mimicking the natural soil biota that occurs in the forest. So kind of a no brainer, but it took about a hundred years of arboriculture to get to this point. We're just gonna replicate what the forest is already telling us to do. So Westchester has about 3000 well sites 
and do these trees fit the well? Um, 400 trees in town, the well size is too small. And we have 553 unknown well sized trees. So in 2019, I went through the market district basically from Chestnut Street to Market Street, north, south, and then from New Street to Walnut. And we looked at, you know, this is the most dense um, urban environment we have. So what was working, we wanted to find out um, what tree wells are, have successful trees, which ones don't, and what size should we be going forward with. So the high density downtown regions are where the heat island is in full effect and where trees suffer the most. So I call it the concrete jungle. It can be as much as 10 degrees warmer than the surrounding suburbs. So in the market district, this is the current uh, well condition. So the five by five tree well was the most common. We have a few three by threes. We have a few boulevard spaces. So a boulevard is just an area that's um, abnormally shaped, uh, more open environment. So the courthouse near the uh, parking garage has more of an open area. Abnormal well spaces, those are mostly the, uh, the bump outs on Gay Street at the entrance. The four by four well was pretty common. And that's pretty much sums up the well size and diameters. Now, in the market district, we had 116 healthy trees and we had about 12%, 29 empty wells. We had 21 trees outgrowing their wells and we had room for 27 additional wells. We had quite a few dead trees and we had a very large percentage of declining trees. So well ratings, only about half of them were rated as good condition. You know, 20% were poor and the rest fair or excellent. Excellent is pretty rare in the market district. So another no brainer, trees with larger wells, they do a lot better, they're way healthier. So the five by five tree wells were most prevalent and they had relatively healthy trees, although they were still young. The larger abnormal wells had the healthiest trees because they had adequate soil volume. So we have this inclination in cities and towns that we have to live in this right angle environment. So we don't have to have right angles everywhere. We can accommodate for trees. Uh, these are some, uh, just random tree wells that I had nothing to do with that I see in town that I encourage this type of behavior though. Um, don't cut the roots, move around the tree. You'll have a lot more success with keeping these large trees alive. So this is actually in Louisville, Kentucky. They have one of the most innovative and progressive uh, urban forest programs in the country that, I've, that I'm aware of right now. So this tree was raising the sidewalk. So instead of redoing the sidewalk and cutting the roots, they just created a platform that raises up and over the root system. It's ADA compliant. And I think it makes for a more interesting urban environment. So it's less than 1% grade. So no problems for wheelchairs or strollers. So it's important that we maximize our soil volume. So our five by five wells provide 75 cubic feet of soil and the average mature tree needs about 4,000 cubic feet. So we're far, far too short of our soil volume requirements. So how do you encourage and improve soil volume in the urban environment when you're hemmed in by concrete everywhere? So we did have new soil volume requirements included in Saldo and now we require soil cells in the dense urban settings in the market district for future development. So improving the soil volume while limiting infrastructure damage is what soil cells can provide. And they improve a lot of the green space design that we work with every day. Um, this is a soil cell. So Dr. James Urban from the University of Florida, he 
was at Cornell when he developed this, but this essentially is a tier system that allows infrastructure to be supported while allowing root space underneath concrete sidewalks, streets, um, even some buildings. So this tree has plenty of soil volume here. So, you know, the average urban tree nationwide lasts seven years in a typical tree well, but a tree like this will last 150 years, maximizing the benefit that we receive. So one of the other issues we're constantly dealing with is tree equity. Dr. Uh, Welch talked about the redlining districts. Um, it wasn't as terrible in Westchester, but we still have an issue where lower socioeconomic parts of town do not have the same tree cover as the um, higher socioeconomic parts of town. So are we equi equitably distributing our green space resources? Um, not very well. And one of the reasons, you know, certain parts of town have a distrust of local government. Um, it's not super easy to put a tree in front of someone's house if they don't want the help or the involvement of local government. So we're trying to grow that organically, no pun intended, um, getting community leaders involved in their own communities to uh, promote the green space in the urban forest. And we've had some success in certain areas. Um, in the college section of town, we also have a, in the rentals, we have a pretty low number of street trees and I don't ask permission there. I just put trees where I think they belong. The, um, the landlords don't seem to mind for the most part. And uh, the students don't damage too many of them. And uh, it does help that they're all the way right now. So we've had a very high success rate with our 2020 planning. So conclusions. So public trees are an essential part of the urban infrastructure. Investing in planting and maintaining urban forest reaps significant ecosystem services. And one of the key takeaways, the tree infrastructure, the urban forest infrastructure is the only infrastructure in an urban environment that increases in value as it ages. So in 150 years, the tree you plant today will be providing 18,000 a year in services, whereas the sewer that we install today will be long gone by then. So city planners need to understand the importance of the urban forest. So we like to maximize our benefits. So planting native species, the right size in the right place. Um, native plants require less maintenance for the most part with a few exceptions with uh, invasive disease. So we try to install natives because of the ecological benefit they provide habitat for, for all kinds of insect and bird life. So to address the ecological crisis, native trees provide critical habitat for declining insect and bird populations. Just a quick uh, sidebar, the native dogwood supports 180 species of, of uh, Lepidoptera or butterflies and pollinators. And the foreign dogwood, the Kusa, supports three. So that's a huge difference. If we're gonna help the insect population, we need to really think before we plant. So the capture and sequester of carbon addresses climate change challenges. And California is already doing a carbon offset taxing. So going forward in the 21st century, we're gonna see the kind of economics of ecology come first and forefront in a lot of planning decisions. So future goals, for the borough of Westchester. So we really wanna to get to that 40% mark for canopy coverage. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's hard to find spots to put these trees. And we have to have people that are willing to accept the tree in front of their house. Although technically we don't need permission. Um, in the new ordinance, we have eminent domain in the right of way, but nobody knows that. So when we stick a tree in front of their house, Sometimes they don't like that. So I try not to plant trees where they're not wanted. And um, I try to test the boundaries where possible. So the rental district, um, putting trees in front of your house, whether you like it or not, but in more of the residential areas, I'm just testing the waters there. And 
some people are really appreciative and some people just hate the idea. So too bad. So increasing public tree plantings in neighborhoods with lower tree canopy cover is something we're working on um, getting involved in some community days, uh, getting students involved with tree planting is a big, a big plan. If we could ever meet again, it would be nice. So we also have to manage our existing tree cover. So taking care of kind of the big thing is this plant a trillion trees that uh, initiative. So we also, we can't just stick trees in the ground without taking care of them. And we have to maintain our existing older trees. Um, Dr. Welch has done a ton of research on the benefits of these large overstory trees. And it's vitally important that we also are maintaining them as we're planting new plants. And uh, as we succession in the forest, we still need to maintain these uh, older veteran trees. So one of my ideas is to build green space corridors integrated into our built environment. I'll show you a design next. Um, and then we're looking at the uh, Miyawaki method of forest restoration, which is a Japanese botanist, um, how to get a forest into a very tight and small community is a planting scheme that is based on light competition. So we densely plant a region and we get trees that grow faster and we get the carbon sequestration in a much shorter time. So a normal forest goes through succession in kind of 75 year increments. We can get that same benefit from a Milwaukee forest in a 25 year iteration. So we're looking at some test sites and uh, Dr. Welch might have some grad students that might be interested in taking on a project like that. So this is Goose Creek, the floodplain. So other cities in our region and the country have integrated their stormwater, their green space infrastructure and their urban forest into a functional ecological and recreation based uh, approach. So there's, a, this is not just a Westchester problem. This is a regional problem. So southeastern Pennsylvania is one of the most heavily dammed in colonial period regions in the entire country. Um, between us and Boston, we had the most mills. So we have really unhealthy streams that have a very high turbidity rate and our channels are really steep and then we channel them even more. So we need to keep as much water on site as possible. And the benefits of that are immense. The trees and plant material naturally cycles the, uh, the pollutants that would then end up in the uh, Delaware River, in the Delaware Bay, that create algal blooms. So we can filter on site, we can handle stormwater. So in order to do that, we have to work with West Goshen and East Bradford. So the headwaters for Goose Creek are behind Kmart and they're over by Henderson High School. So there's a lot of available space and then there's a lot of space that's completely devoid of anything to work with. But if we restore the floodplain north of town and then we have a lot of room down here, I think that we would have a good way to manage storm flow and then turn this into some uh, park-like atmosphere. So there is two major parks here on the uh, southeast side of Westchester that we have space to work with. And then we have, um, I can't remember the name of this creek now, but this is also an existing floodplain restoration project that is not very long sighted. It's pretty, uh, pretty basic from an engineering perspective, but it could turn into something that's more enhanced with riparian buffer. Plum run? Plum run, that's what it's called. There's only like 10 names for creeks in all of Pennsylvania. So there's like 15 plum runs, but it's a dumb name. But this is our plum run. Yeah, it's the best plum run. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. So this um, is another example of just better green space design. We don't have to live in right angles. So I really like this. Um, having these tree trenches rather than tree wells 
um, this is the cheapest way to improve the soil volume. You know, we don't have, so the, the soil cell idea is really expensive and it, it's a really good plan for like a dense urban environment. But for most people, if we just think about the design a little bit more, you know, I prefer not using concrete. You can do this with bricks. Now there's bricks that are permeable. I mean, bricks are more permeable than concrete, but now there's even more permeable bricks that look like the Westchester look. And I, this person here has done a really nice job. This is on Price Street. Actually, no, Sharpless. And this tree has a lot more volume to work with. And they've also gotten rid of all their grass in their front yard. So it's completely, um, you know, natural native landscape is aeroscaped and doesn't require a ton of water, but stores a ton of water. So the march to a 40% canopy. Um, I always like Emerson's quote, the uh, creation of a thousand forest is in one acorn. So every single tree we plant, it, you know, it's, it has meaning and we need to treat it as such. So when I got here, we were only planting hundred trees a year. Um, now we're doing 200 and that's mostly funded from the stream protection fee, which is a really good illustration of why, you know, why that fee makes sense. Um, I'm not getting into the politics with the university, but <laughs> so they focusing on mass planting in one region has another idea. So rather than just kind of plant a tree here or there, trying to overwhelm a neighborhood with trees. Um, we did that on South Walnut Street. We put about 50 trees in, in two blocks and people noticed the difference rather than, you know, putting one tree here. And then, you know, traditionally people would request a tree and the, you know, they just wanted a tree that had a nice flower. So really trying to work with residents to understand that trees aren't just an aesthetic concern, it's, you know, an ecological concern. In the 21st century, if we're going to survive climate change, then we need to bring nature into our, our cities. And it's really important that we plant the right tree in, in the city, in your front yard, in your well space. So I didn't provide anything in APA format. Um, if I was a student of Dr. Welch, you'd probably found me, but, but Dr. Welch, of course, did, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was wonderful. Thank you, Mike. So I guess we have time for questions or? Yeah, th thank you so much uh, to both of you for this um, really important uh, presentation. We're at um, 12.44 and usually I'll pause us at 12.50 because sometimes people have to, to leave at that point to get ready for another class or um, uh, responsibility. Um, what I'd like to do is, is not pause at 12.50 but invite you, Joan and Mike uh, to talk as uh, long as you can because I am guessing there are a lot of interesting comments and questions. Um, so we won't go through any formal process. If you have a question for our presenters, uh, please uh, unmute yourself. And um, uh, I look forward to the conversation. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm, I have a question for you, Mike Arborist. Like when I Googled that, it's tree surgeon. Honestly, I don't know much about that. Like what did you, how did you become that? What was your background? Um, I didn't set out to be an arborist when I was in high school by any means. I, I enjoyed working outside and I went to Shippensburg University and I majored in geoenvironmental and I had a really big background with GIS in college. And at that point in the nineties, the forest service was hiring GIS people to do hazard tree assessments. And that's when I first started working with trees through the forest service. So the Forest Service doesn't pay very well. So, and you end up living in weird places that are great places, but my wife tricked me to move back to Westchester in 2006 and I had to uh, find work and there's not a lot of Forest Service action in Westchester. So I started working for a urban forestry firm and you know, the industry, the tree industry in general is, uh, 
kind of really there's two ends of the spectrum there's guys with chainsaws and then there's like phds out there like actually making a difference um so i've been fortunate to kind of be both sides of that spectrum and i don't have a phd by any means but i'm working on that thank you and also just a random question when i go to walk at gordon natural area there's um not too long ago i guess they made the tree into a bear do you guys know what i'm talking about no it's oh you do okay do you know why they did that like was it dying or it's just f something fun they wanted to do yeah so there's some really wonderful ways that you can repurpose trees that have died and one of them is to leave it in place and do something with it, make it into a sculpture or even just leave it for the woodpeckers and other organisms to, to have at it and use for food source or, or habitat. But yeah, that's, they, they did, that was a, a tree that had died. Okay. Then, yeah. So you should check out the one at Marshall Square Park too. So. Yeah. Okay, I will. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So Michael, it says, there's a question in the chat that says, is there anyone from Michael's office that will provide consultations for Westchester Borough residents about best landscaping solutions for optimal ecology? And I assume that means connecting it to the tree landscape. Yeah, if anybody wants to reach out directly, um, I think you posted my email somewhere on here, um, but I'm done at west-chester.com. So I have limited time in my Westchester duties to meet as with private residential matters. Um, so with the budget, we're um, pretty tight this year with the COVID concerns. So I can always talk on the phone if nothing else, but it, if it is a street tree concern, I usually can do a little sidebar from the uh, street tree assessment. So, but um, yeah, just reach out to me by email and we'll, we'll connect. Or you can get, you can call Public Works directly as well. Mike or Joan, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I had I had to sign off for part of it, so you may have talked about this. I was just curious on what the status of the uh, of the Emerald Ash Borer is in the Westchester area. Yeah, I can cover that. So the first. EAB sighting in Chester County was 2017. And we are now on our fourth uh, cycle of treatment for emerald ash borer in the borough. So we're using a direct injection of a systemic insecticide that resides within the tree for two years um, and has very little side effect. So any boring insect that will eat the tree generally dies. It's about 98.5% effective. Um, Long term, there's kind of two schools of thought. So it's potential that it might just eat through the area and then not have any hosts in 20 years. There's also potential that it could just be managed like any other yeah. insect at some well, point. Well, back in 2014, there were a bunch of trees treated in, I can't remember the name of the park now. Mm -hmm. uh, Hoops. Hoops Park. Yeah. Uh, did anything ever occur in Hoops Park? Um, so we actually were working with a research company from Canada in Hoops Park. And we had live traps set up and we, we found about 478 um, active adults in 2019. And we were expecting about 10 to 30. So the activity was really heavy in Hoops. And uh, most of the trees in Hoops Park, the overstory trees are ash and walnut. So yes, yeah. um, we that's been treated now uh, three times. Yeah. Okay. We're we're gonna pull the plug on a few of those trees that. So there's another disease called ash yellows that some of them have. Mm -hmm. So any ash tree that's not in premium condition is not a good candidate for treatment. And they um, any any sort of vascular restriction the the access that we inject with is through the vascular tissue itself. So any sort of vascular impingement, we really have very low success rate, so. Yeah, one last bug question. Spotter and lantern fly impacts on any urban trees in the borough? Yeah, so that's another thing 
spotter and lanternfly hasn't killed a single desirable specimen tree <laughs> in all of North America. And all these companies now are just putting chemicals on every single tree that could potentially be a host. So the host range is very wide. Um, the major hosts on the streets are red maples and mm -hmm. river birch. And really the major issue is more of a nuisance factor. So the insect will rain grass as it's eating. Um, it can be a slip trip hazard. It, you know, my tree house got hammered this year with lanternfly excrement and I um, had the power wash because it, kids, it's not a safe place to be anyway. And um, it was really slippery on the, uh, near the slide. So I did treat two of my trees in my house, but I don't recommend just treating because it could potentially be an issue. If you have a tree with another issue in conjunction with spotted lanternfly, you could have, you know, decline, but no mortality has been recorded, so. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I had a question. Um, hi, I'm Melanie Vile. I'm in the Department of Health at Westchester, and I'm also on the West Goshen Sustainability Council. Hey. Um, and uh, I missed the, the very beginning of your lecture, and I apologize. And I was just wondering, you spoke about funding, and I, my first question is, where, who funded you? And secondly, um, it seems like most of your work was in the borough, and I don't know if that's because part of Westchester University is in the borough. Um, and part of it is in West Goshen. So I was just wondering if you did work in West Goshen Township as well. Are you you're speaking to me? Uh, you or Joan? Yep. Well, I, I work all over the, um, the country. So <laughs> I'm a consulting arborist and I work for the borough about two days a week. So um, I do environmental or forestry projects pretty much in the entire Mid-Atlantic region. Then I guess my first question is geared towards Joan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I, I would say to you that uh, we got funding through the Office of Sustainability and the uh, Office for Sponsored Research. And they have this grant available every year. And maybe Brad can, can confirm that that's going to happen this year. And um, it's just a, a little bit of money, but my project was focused on the borough because we also have a green legacy database that's campus trees and it was a nice compliment to get the street trees and the campus trees uh, all done and i live in the borough so so fred are um, we gonna have yeah thank, thanks thanks john for mentioning that um the Office of Sustainability working with the Office for Research and Sponsored Programs has um, had a sustainability grants for scholarly and creative activities for the past uh, three years. They're, they're small grants. Um, the application process is really simple. Um, they're for a maximum of $2,000, but as you can see from today's presentation, they have funded some really um, innovative and important uh, research. Um, we are not positive we're gonna be able to do it this year because of uh, just all the budget constraints of the, the pandemic. Um, but I'm glad you've asked about it, uh, Professor Bile, and I will um, uh, reach out uh, to you once I contact uh, the Office for Research and Sponsored Programs. Great, what, thank you very much. What, what really type of uh, grants were you looking for? Um, well, I just, um, I know that there are some um, U.S. Forest Service grants that um, focus on sustainability uh, issues that are available. Um, I haven't explored those very much, um, actually just recently, last week, the first time. And I was just curious about what kinds of projects they would fund. And, you know, just in terms of thinking about sustainability, not just on campus, but in our townships, um, trying to, you know, basically bring money into either the township or the university to promote these efforts on a, a, a broader scale. So like the entire Westchester area and beyond. Yeah, one of the, the best ways to uh, funnel money is to kind of combine um, uh, stormwater issues into grant funding. So um, one of the companies I work with is Stream Restoration Company, and 
the grant funding for that is in the millions of dollars in the Mid-Atlantic region. And, you know, volunteer efforts with uh, tree planting for riparian buffers are usually pretty easy to fund. So um, as far as sustainability, it, you know, it's just one wing of that, but. Well, that's helpful. Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you. Um, Susan Sharks, who's also on this, um, uh, on the Zoom, she, we are, she's also on the West Goshen Township Committee and we are, we spoke last about riparian buffers. And so um, we might reach out to you for more information about that, Michael, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, if we were in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, it would be a lot easier to operate, but the, the available funding in the Delaware watershed is really disparate and it's hard to put larger projects together. And one thing to think about when you do a riparian buffer is that there's a level of protection that makes it harder to do an entire floodplain restoration down the road. So I always try to get people to think floodplain restoration prior to riparian buffer um, because there's some legal hurdles and the riparian buffers, they are beneficial, but they sometimes don't work. And the banks get undermined and then the trees just wash away. So um, there's a lot of nuance with that. Thank you, this has been really helpful, thanks. Hey Mike, I have two comments on your Forest Service statements. You know, there are some good jobs, good paying jobs in the yes. Forest Service, number one. Number two is, is yes, they do send you some real wacky places. I retired from the US Forest Service in Westchester. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the local office got moved to Minnesota, though. It did, but I'm yeah. I'm gone. I'm retired. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're actually, yeah. Yeah. No, I I actually I love my time with the Forest Service. I have no no complaints. Um, I didn't even know what the value of money was when I was working there. So. <laughs> I had two quick questions. Um, you mentioned, Joan, that you documented about 2,800 trees in this um, research project. I wonder how that number compares to the number of trees on other pro public property like parks in the borough and how it compares to trees on private property, um, homes and businesses and uh, Westchester University's campus. So when we did a, the Green Legacy study, and that was in 2009, and Jerry Hertel was part of that, we looked at campus and uh, we didn't uh, necessarily look at uh, individual tree densities, but we did look at canopy cover. And that's one of the ways that you can measure it. And I wanted to bring up that the 40% canopy cover is a really important metric and that includes both public and private trees. Okay. But David Nowak and um, what's the other guy's name, they're saying that in the Eastern deciduous forest biome, 40 is the minimum that you can have up to 60% tree canopy cover in urban environments. And that maybe that, you know, we should, we need to hit 40. <laughs> we're only at about 25% in the borough, at least we were in 2009. And uh, I, I'm going to offer to my students this semester that if somebody wants to do a tree canopy cover evaluation of the borough, it's it's about time. And campus was only 19% tree canopy cover at that point in time. So we are woefully under canopied <laughs> in the borough. And, uh, and we really, I would like to address that. Yeah. I would like to have some uh, Mayawaki forest restoration spots on campus. I'd like to try and get some a little quick forest restoration parts happening around campus. And, um, and yeah, so the, I'm not real clear on the how many trees are in the parks, how many trees are on the street, and how many trees are in public spaces. But we do have the tree canopy or I'm sorry, the tree database for campus. So that we could do. We did an inventory for Marshall Square Park as well. So there's about 225 trees at Marshall, which is um, A lot. one of the least densely treed parks. So 
I have another question, but I want to give other people a chance if anyone else, uh, uh, Sarah or Walt or anyone else who's still on the call, if you have a question. Oh, I'll, I want, uh, yeah. <laughs> Here I am. About Marshall Square Park, are there still specimen trees that date from back in the 19th century when Josiah Hoops had uh, planted a lot in there? Um, yeah, there's probably a few. I, um, look, having looked at trees for a long time, I think most people tend to overestimate the age of their trees. Um, so I've used some tools that you can measure the tree rings through sound technology without having to cut the tree down. And the I know for a fact there's some trees that were planted in the 1880s that are documented. Uh -huh. um, I don't think there's anything from um, you know early 1800s, but there are trees from that time period around Westchester and potentially in Westchester. Um, I think a, it'd be a really interesting project for a student to, uh, to um, take that on as a master's project. Um, there is definitely some stories. Um, Westchester is connected to the history of, you know, botany in North America, as well as um, kind of nursery, uh, history. So the Hoops Brothers Nursery supplied a very high percentage of the uh, cherry trees in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And one of those still exists to this day. Um, well, the gifted one from Japan, the half of the shipment was um, covered in scale and we supplied the other half to D.C. But one of the gifted ones that a congressman from Westchester was is still on Minor Street to this day. So and um, we have a heritage tree database now. So we have about a hundred entries now. Um, the uh, qualifications are just size and species. So there's a lot of stories that have come out of, as these trees have been entered in. So I'm working with our special collections library and I'm the science and health librarian and, mm -hmm. uh, at the university and our special collections librarian and I are working on the legacy of William Darlington and the other botanists. Yep. And he's, he's doing a kind of an online project called uh, Botany and the Brandywine. And I guess that could include the Goose Creek watershed if uh, there's some legacy trees in honor of Humphrey Marshall in Marshall Square Park. And I think is what the Josiah Hoots was doing at the time in the 19th century. Yeah, I mean, so um, tie that in. You could write a book just on John Marshall alone or Humphrey Marshall. So, yeah. That's right. I had one last question, if I may. Um, you mentioned the importance of selecting uh, native species um, uh, as often as possible. How good are private nurseries with recommending native species at this point? Um, you know, is it is it sort of common knowledge that this is something homeowners and businesses should be doing when they when they plant new trees? Um, there's nurseries that's like specify in natives only. Um, so I've had really weird conversations all across the board. Um, when Doug Tallamy's book was first released, I had people that wanted to remove fully mature canopy trees because they weren't native. And I do think that is the wrong approach. Um, that tree still has an, you know, environmental benefit. So the, and, you know, the urban environment is not, not exactly this pristine environment. So I, I do encourage to plant native and pseudo native and a little bit ahead of the uh, climate change pattern. So if there's some people that will only plant what was here in 1491 and nothing else, but we don't have the same climate and the you know Anthropocene error. We've really altered the climate even before 1491. So I I encourage people to plant smart plants. Sometimes they're not always native, but the the movement for natives is pretty varied. Um, if you look at Ann Fowler's Plants of Pennsylvania book. I mean, she lists prickly pear cactus as a native and it occurs in two very random sections of, of Pennsylvania in the wild. So 
I don't know if I would recommend that for everybody, but so. I, I would say that the nurseries are going to sell you what they yeah. have in stock. And you have to be, you have to support the native plant nurseries because um, in my research in the urban forest in Boston, every nursery was pushing Norway maple and that was the most often planted street tree in the 1970s, right? And so um, you have to know your nursery and you have to be supportive of, of people who provide native trees and you have to be a little bit critical, right? When you go in what they're what they're saying to you but Michael's point is a good one that you know we're not going to take out the non-native trees because they're still doing all that other stuff you know they may not be doing the best in the habitat area but we we've got energy savings and carbon sequestration etc but just really try and consider native first if there are other trees that are better for that site then by all the means, other thing um you know I always try to encourage people to ask their nursery provider where their plants are coming from so a lot of nurseries don't locally grow their plants. They're container plants that come in from uh, the Pacific Northwest. They have a much longer growing season. They don't have harsh winters. So a, a tree that's seeded from stock from a different part of the, the world can be predetermined to have a certain level of growth span. So it might not be getting the best plant for this region. Um, also soil quality, uh, nurseries in New Jersey grow native plants but they're also growing in sand. So they, you know, they get to Pennsylvania, we have a very hard clay substrate and it's a lot of times they have planting shock and stress from that transition. So, and that's another way trees can girdle themselves, not just from burlap and containers, but from not being accustomed to growing in a clay substrate. So they take the easy way and they just go in the right angles and wrap around themselves. But. <laughs> Um, there's a few people that do it really well. Um, Natural Landscapes Nursery and Jennersville. The uh, uh, Mr. Plyler is getting up there and I know he's trying to sell the nursery. He's a little bit difficult to work with um, as is any good nursery guy. Um, uh, Harmony Hill Nursery in uh, Downingtown. They're not exclusively native, but he sources all the plants locally and seeds and grafts his own material. So, red bud nursery and media is good. Yep. So, what was that one in media? Red bud. Red bud. Yeah, under new ownership, they're doing a good job. Yep. They took over from uh, Kathy. And is uh, Octorera Nursery as well as um, they they don't have large material that as far as conservation grade stuff that they're exclusively native so yeah that's where chester ridley crumb watershed association gets its trees yeah. for and they, also restoration. Have, they have a proprietary liner that is really has a nice deep root that they really improve the survivability a lot of these conservation plots they stick trees out and then you know they have planned succession where you get 50 percent mortality and they do a really nice job of keeping them alive um just through their cultural practice. One ten p.m. You've given us a, an extra twenty minutes, and yeah, this was really good. We we don't want to um, abuse your generosity, so thank you very much for uh, this presentation and the conversation afterwards. Well, thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, you'll be back, no doubt. Hopefully, it wasn't <laughs> too boring. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Yeah. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye. Goodbye. Enjoy the sunshine. Yep.